It's 7 p.m. I'm going to start right at 7 p.m. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this conference. I ask in the mighty name of Jesus that as we go into your word, that we will glean what is really on your mind at this particular hour. And through the revelation we receive, we'll make the right adjustments to cause there to be a massive flow of your spirit in our ministries and our churches in 2024, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. All right, welcome all to this um, webinar. And they said I will start at 7 and start at 7. Because I want to spend precisely one hour here sharing. And uh, there's something God has laid on my heart, which I want to share. Okay? And it has to do with um, adjustments that we may have to make um, in order for there to be greater effectiveness within um, churches. And I'm particularly speaking to pastors, all right? I'm not speaking to generality of ministers or ministry gifts. I'm speaking to the pastoral gift, even though principles are applicable, but I'm confining what I'm saying to the office of the pastor. Because I believe one of the added things that God has given me is in this area of training um, in pastoral work. All right. First of all, I what I want to establish is really what is the work of a pastor. Okay, Because when somebody says that I am starting a church. I am called to pastor people. What exactly is on the mind of God for that particular individual there? And how important that work is to God. It is very, very important to God. Uh, the scripture says, train a child in which way in which he shall go. And when he grows up, he will not depart from it. The way and manner in which people are pastored when they are developing as Christians, they may not be able to overcome every negativity that may have been deposited into them if they were pastored wrongly. If they were abused within those churches in terms of emotional abuse, they were placed, it will affect them and could affect them for their entire Christian work as in, they may also become abusive personalities, all right, in the administration of it. So the work of a pastor is like a family. That's it's the of a local church is like a family. What a family is to the larger society is what the local church is to the body of Christ. All right, we just don't do a lot of research in the things of in in religion, so to speak. But I'm sure we'll have found patterns of behavior, patterns there, if we look at the local churches and the way people were taught and the way people were trained. Okay? So first of all, let us define what this work is and how important it is to God. And the first scripture I want us to look at is in Jeremiah chapter 3, um, and verse 14 and 15. And then we'll look at the parallel somewhere else. He said, Turn, O ye, O black, backsliding children, said the Lord, for I'm married unto you, and I will take you one of a city and two of a family, and I will bring you to Zion. And in the Old Testament, Zion means a type of the church. And I will give you pastors according to my heart. That I'll give you pastors according to my own heart. And what these pastors are going to do is that they will feed you with knowledge and understanding. And the effect of it is, and it shall come to pass when you be multiplied and increased in the land in those days, said Lord. They shall say no more, and goes on. So what the pastors after the heart of God 
are to do in this work of a pastoral office here is to feed people with knowledge and to feed them with understanding. Now, if you're feeding them with knowledge and with understanding, and it's important you go into those words to really understand, but that's not what I want to talk about. I want to get, get into this some other way. What, what the word knowledge and what the word understanding really means. But it says to feed them with knowledge and understanding. It says they will increase, all right, they'll be multiplied and they shall increase in the land. So those two words speak about, there are two expressions of growth, multiplication and increase in the land. And he says, I'll give them pastors according to my own heart, who will feed them with knowledge and feed them also with understanding. And he says, it will come to pass that when you are multiplied, all right, and when you have increased in the land, so we see that the first principal work of the pastor there and has to understand this is that my business as a pastor is to first feed people with knowledge and to also feed them there with understanding. Now, if you look at what Jesus had to say concerning this, all right, feeding them with knowledge and understanding. Now, Jesus met with Peter. This was just before he ascended and went to the Father. And he had a conversation. They had caught fish. Now, listen to what Jesus said. Just listen well to Jesus. Jesus said unto them, come and die. And none of the disciples does ask him, why, who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? So nobody asked, who are you? All right, this was just after his resurrection, before he ascended. And Jesus cometh and taketh bread and give them and fish likewise. This is now the third time that Jesus showed himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus said unto Simon Peter, hear what he said, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And hear what Jesus said. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Then he says, He saith unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. And he said unto him again, Feed my sheep. You won't find anywhere. I mean, this is almost like the African proverb where you say, how many times have I called your name? I mean, you won't find anywhere Jesus talking to a person this way about something. That you say, then say it again, then say it again. And then he said the third time to him, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And Peter was grieved because he said it unto him the third time. That Why are you being so repetitive about this? He says, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou know that I love thee. And Jesus said, feed my sheep. So Jesus said, lovest thou me more than these? Now to us, these, these could mean traveling. All right. These, these could mean success. All right. There's no point in typing anything. Nobody is seeing it, please. So it's, nobody's going to see what you typed. So there's no point in greeting people. So let's just focus on, on the message. All right, this could mean traveling. Do you love me more than success? Do you love me more than these, your friends, uh, everybody that was there? Do you love me more than prosperity? Do you love me more than anything? He says, cars, anything. He said, if you do, then turn your central focus to this. Feed my sheep. So we can see here from that prophetic book and then also what Jesus said, the attitude of Jesus, that feeding his sheep is uppermost on the heart all right, of Jesus. And he said, look, if a person stands in the office of a pastor, a spiritual leader, nothing 
that I bless you with, this is what he's saying, must interfere. Or if anything that you have on the outside interferes with you feeding the sheep of, of his sheep, then your love has been turned away from Christ and it has been turned all right, to these other things. So the first work of a pastor is to feed, all right, the sheep, not to organize events, um, not to have buildings. The first thing is, and that should be the central focus of it, feed my sheep. Now, let me just say this about pastoral work. Pastoral work, therefore, is not as glamorous as a traveling minister. Let me be very frank with you. All right? Because you will have to sit with your people. You cannot, you know, sometimes people invite me for meetings, and I see the pattern of invitation, which means the people they invite are traveling ministers who are not local pastors. And they expect me to do what those people do, which is you miss your Sunday because you want to preach. A pastor's office is different from a traveling minister, and it's not as glamorous as that. In other words, if you travel, protocol officers will come and let's, let's just assume, pick you up, you know, take you, you can, you can you do all this. But look, pastoring is not, is not, is not glamorous that way. All right. And so you've got to understand what this work really is about and devote. And it's because people don't devote themselves to that work. But somewhere subconsciously, the church is a stepping stone to their own ministries. And they are looking at their own ministries outside the four walls of the church as a measure, all right, of their success, not in the pastoral office doing that pastoral work. A shepherd will claim the sheep. There are things that a shepherd does and is central there. Now, you must understand that the death knell on any church is if the people have a sense of ambition abandonment, all right, by their pastor, where it seems that the pastor loves his ministry more than them. So, for example, now, I have, um, I, I have a teaching ministry. I can, you know, stand in the office of a teacher and be going around and teaching. Okay? So, I'm, I, I, can, I can do that. I'm just taking a teacher and be teaching. And then you abandon the church, all right, to pursue your ministry. Now, we'll get to this. God may call you out of the pastoral work at some point and call you into an apostolic um, ministry. But if it's calling you to an apostolic ministry, which means, you know, to go out of church there into an apostolic ministry, and we'll, we'll talk about that. And I believe that a lot of, well, this will be for young pastors, but senior pastors who are now bored with what they're doing, it is a routine uh, because they have hit a plateau in the pastoral work. And there's a point of inflection. And with many of them, it might be they've been called to do some apostolic work. And because they haven't decoded that apostolic work there, and when you call to do that apostolic work, then you release, there's a release of the churches there. And you understand that you have a time period in which you train people to raise people up so that they'll be able to stand in that office of a pastor there and hold things together while you go into the apostolic. So you can do that. All right, Pastor Debbie, at some point, technically, he was pastoring the main church there um, in uh, Iputebeta. But he moved into an apostolic office where he doesn't 
necessarily pastor now. He doesn't pastor a congregation. All right. But he has moved into that office where they have things like just like they're doing the Holy Ghost Congress, Holy Ghost Nights, where you can see an apostolic dimension in his ministry. All right. But with that, there's a strong thing calling there to train people, all right, into the pastoral office and them to have capacity to function there as part. So it could be that. But what I'm saying is that you can't, you know, um, at the same time, be saying you are the pastor of the church, all right, but you are not seen for long periods, all right, of time. I'm telling you historically what has. Um, someone told me that Bishop T. Jake said he only had it can only miss four Sundays a year from his church. Four Sundays, one, two, three, four. Okay, these are these are little things here that cause people, all right, because they, they don't understand the work of the of the pastor. Let, let, let me give an example here. In John chapter 10, we just see this here. And people mustn't have this feeling in John 10, all right, and verse 12 to 13. Jesus said, but he that is a hurling. Now, a hurling is somebody who is into something for money. And not the shepherd. Whose own the sheep are not. Seeth the wolf coming. Liveth the sheep that abandons them and flees, and the wolf catches them and scatters the sheep. The herling fleeth because he is an herling and careth not for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep. I am none of mine, as father knoweth me. All right. And then he goes in 17, Therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life, in other words, for the sheep. So he lays down his life. And these are the essential things it takes to succeed in the office of the pastor. And look, even if you have a nudging inside your heart, God has called me to this. First of all, do that pastoring work and do it to its fullness. All right. And, and build a solid, because uh, solid work there. Okay. And then you can get promoted by God to something else. Now, let's just look at what Jesus prayed. Just look at what Jesus prayed here. And you get a glimpse of the heart, all right, of a pastor. He says, I've glorified thee. This was his last prayer before he left on the earth. I have finished the work which thou givest me. Okay, so he was going to something else. But there was a work. That's why I said you can go to something else. You can pastor a church and move into something else. Okay. And now, O oh Father, glorify thou me with thy own self, with the glory which I had before the world was. I have manifested thy name unto the men which thou givest me out of the world. Thine they were, and thou givest them to me. So when you're a pastor, God has taken his own people and given his people to you to care for those people. And they have kept thy word. Now they have known that all things whatsoever thou hast given me are for thee. Then he says, I have given them the words, which are remas. Now that's where the knowledge and understanding is. And we'll get into that. The remas, which you have given me. And that's how you feed people is with remas. They have received them and have known surely that I came out from thee. And they have believed that thou didst send me. Now look at what this point is. Look at his prayer. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou has given me, for they are thine. So you can see the heart of the shepherd. I said, look, I'm not praying for the world. I'm praying for these ones, all right, that you have given me. And then he went on and said, I pray not only for them, but for people that shall hear through their words. So, how is the church going to start growing and multiplying? Is the people there that multiply? It's the people there that multiply. So it says, I pray not for these ones, but not just for these ones, but those who will hear through their words. So the church is going to grow from these 20 people who, or 30 people, or 100 people, or 500 people, from people who are going to hear through these people. So you want to pour your life right, into the people. I, I know what I'm talking about. Men who are not pouring their life into the people. All right? They're not. There's a there's an emotional detachment. They may preach every Sunday, but there's an, 
there's that absentiness there when it comes to that. I'm not talking about interaction with people and getting emotionally entangled with people and building soul ties with people and the whole environment becomes controlling. And when somebody says they want to do something, you know, they feel bad because of some emotion. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about pouring your life, all right, into the people and knowing that my future is these people. Okay, that's that's my future. And you're pouring your life right into them. So what is the food that you are feeding them with? And we saw what Jesus said, the effect of pastors, people that are not being pastored. You know, he saw the people scattered as sheep without shepherd and they fainted. Now, when he was going to commission his disciples, what did he say? He said, look, he saw them scattered as sheep without shepherd. In other words, the whole world needs to be pastored. Look, churches, a local church is the genius of Christianity. It's the genius. You know, this, this is what God did, okay? Uh, at first, he walked through families. So he established that. And once God does something, God doesn't discard with what he does. He builds on it. So he showed us something, walked through families. So Abraham, his family, or Isaac, his family. He walked through families. There's families here. So you will walk through the family. You'll walk through this person, their children. So you walk through families. Then he moved and walked through nations. So a nation, okay? So he took the nation of Israel now and began to walk through the nation. What you still see inside that walk within the nation he was also still walking with families inside, but well, there was a focus now on nation. So David, it was his only family that could be king in Judah. So you could see family and that. Then when we got into the New Testament, it now got into the local church. That is why you'll find in the book of Revelation, when Jesus began to speak, said, say to the church, say to the church at Laodicea, say to the church at Ephesus, he began to, the, the local church, is, is what God has his eagle eye on right now. And Jesus said, he said, look, I, if, if I could get this whole world, people into clusters where they are being pastored will solve all the problem that is in the world. That's what literally he said. All right? So you can understand, all right? It's just like saying that you get the whole world. And that's what he did with the whole, everybody's born into a family. And if the parents do the work that they are supposed to do within society there, you cannot have a bad society where you have a collection of great families. And that is a result of good parenting. And that goes, starts with the father. So it's the same thing here. So some of the things we see today about rudeness, about people speaking anyhow, it's, it's because people weren't pastored properly. I'm telling you. All right? When people backslide, people go on social media and talk about Jesus, and it's because of, of it's, just, it's just like saying bad home train people. It's the same thing here. So he looked at them as sheep without shepherd, and they were scattered, they fainted, they were affected, all right, by the things on the outside. And he looked at them and said, look, these people need shepherds. Now, Go and minister with God's power to them. But this is just a bandage we are putting on it until we can establish local churches and get those people into local churches there. All right, so their food, which is what the pastor has to do every time he stands up to speak to the people, is that he has to release remas into their lives. Now, a rema is a word that is quickened by the Spirit of God to that particular individual. In other words, if you're going to feed people, it can be scriptures from memory. It can be scriptures. It can be teaching from knowledge. It can be teaching from memory. It has to be the quickened word that you are teaching. In other words, if you stand to speak, the word was quickened to you, which means what you are telling them, there was an encounter with the Holy Spirit. This is why... Look, it's 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 tough for a, a a pastor to preach in several places because if you are going to go with the integrity of ministry, you can get away with speaking out of knowledge, you can get away with speaking out of memory, you can get away with speaking from your notes. But 
it takes some measure of work to speak from the lemmas that God gives because he's given us this day our daily bread. It's every day there is a rema that it's, it's, you have to speak from the rema, which means from the quickened word of God there. So there are food are the remas of God, which God gives to you. The words quickened by the spirit of God to you. And this is what the human heart and the whole of humanity longs for. You know, if we look at John chapter 6 here, from verse 63, John 6, all right, and we look at from verse 63 right down to verse 68, we will see that when they wanted to leave, some people left the ministry of Jesus, and Jesus said, well, the Father never drew them, and you've got to understand this, all right, in ministry. No matter how solid you are, people will leave your church, all right? And you, you will become an emotional wreck if you don't understand that. People left the ministry of Jesus. You can't, you can't minister more powerfully than Jesus. He healed the sick. He did everything. He was sin-free. People left. All right. So people live in a church doesn't define something. And if you're a pastor and you do have integrity, all right. Well, I'm not, I'm not going to that because that's ethics of ministry. That's not what we want to say here. All right. So it says, it is the spirit that quickeneth. The, the flesh profited nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. So these are remas. So these are spirit and life. But there are some of you that believe not. For Jesus knew from the beginning who they were that believe not, and who should betray him. And he said, therefore, all right, he said unto them, no man can come unto me except it were given unto him by my father. So he said this. Okay, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Then Jesus said to the 12, will you also go away? And Simon Peter answered and gave the clue here. To whom shall we go? Thou hast the words of eternal life or the remas of eternal life. In other words, your words are transferring that spiritual substance away into our lives. In Acts chapter 5 and verse 20, we see the angel telling Peter, go back, all right, to the temple and speak these words or, or the words of this life unto them. All right, so he says, go, stand and speak in the temple to the people, all the remas of this life. So what you have to understand, okay? And you can preach good sermons that will not feed the hearts of people, that will not answer questions, that will not be the very thing on the mind of God for them that day. It's good, but not divine. It's not prophetic in nature. Prophetic means it doesn't reveal what is on the mind and heart of God for that very moment for the people, but it's good. All right? So there's good, there's bad, and then there's what's divine. And Balaam said, he said, I'll neither do good nor bad, but only that which the Father or God speaks that will I repeat. So it's about making sure you get these words out of God to pass this across. That's why Jesus said, do you love me more than this? Because to get those words there, you can be distracted by things. Okay? I mean, I, I put that up on a tweet. I was preparing for this. My team was playing, lovest thou me more than this? Okay? Uh, you you want to travel somewhere and God tells you, look, I need you to stand still with me for a week so I can get certain things across to you that you want to pass across. Lovest thou me more than, all right, your travel? All right, so it's words of this life. And let me say something. It's one of the strong things I want to say in this um, materials power. Social media has almost become a distraction to pastoral work. And the reason why I'm saying this is that people are looking at people who are not pastors. And they are in their own calling. They are not pastors. So they have, they can have a traveling ministry. Okay? 
Now, you see, I don't want to, but let me leave that, but they have a traveling ministry and they go around and they travel. And people see this, oh, they come in a jeep, they come in this, they fly in this. And it's going to distract people who are called to be pastors. And they now want that lifestyle. All right? So if you are called to pastor, pastor, you are not a traveling evangelist or at that point an apostle. Sit with your people. And grow your church. And if you do that, you will grow that church without limits, I'm telling you. If you sit with your people, you will grow that church without limits. You will break all limitations as you impart life. I mean, I, I can give an example. Bishop David Ego says, God blessed him with a private jet. The day the jet came, he said, I have no really to travel out of this country. We stay within the borders of Nigeria. I think they're going, he's going on the sixth year. Lovest thou me more than this? All right? I mean, I was called to go and preach somewhere, and it was going to be a big meeting and all that, and it, and it was going to clash with the midweek service of one of our campuses, and in that midweek service, maybe there are 400 people that come for it at that particular point in time. I sacrificed that for the midweek service. Okay? So, Here's the first thing that we've got to do. And this is the corrective word that God placed in my heart to say. All right. To pastors. That's why I said this for pastors. That we have to go back to our first love. That people have been hugely distracted from the real work of pastoring. Now, I'm not, I've, I've told you, people are called into those offices. People are called into the office of evangelism. You are not there. You know, I remember once, many years ago, uh, this was maybe 1994 or something, you know, I went to see, I, I will not call the name of the man, so you know who I'm talking about. I went to see a man of God, and he told me, he said, look, he said, people come and meet me here, and they say they're having these, and there are thousands of people there, thousands of people there, thousands of people there. He said, look, God told me, sit down here with me, study this. And I'll give you instructions. And he told me, said, leave that. God said, I should sit down here. Today, he has surpassed those people multiple times. Now, Revelations chapter 2. Because for people to enter into God's will for their lives, you have to pray for them either by face or by name. It's detailed. The work of a pastor is detailed. But I don't think there will be any form of blessing that will come to a person beyond that which a true shepherd will get in their lives. And that blessing will extend all over your family. Now, Revelations 2, 1 here. Unto the angel church at Ephesus, write this. And the church at Ephesus, read the letter. They said that was probably the finest letter Paul penned in terms of revelation without correcting anything in church. But hear what uh, Jesus said here. And all these churches today are Catholic. They are Catholic churches now. All these churches, Ephesus, everything, they are Catholic churches. They, they lost the, the spirit. So he says, These things saith he to him that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden sticks. I know thy works. So they were doing works. I know thy labor. I know thy patience how you cannot bear them which are evil. And thou hast tried them which say the apostles and are not, and found them light, and has borne, and has patience, for my name's sake, has labored, and has not fainted. Nevertheless, he said, I have something against you, because thou hast left your first love. He said, remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen. In other words, you are once there. And ask any Christian, what were you doing at the beginning that you are falling from? Is prayer and the study of the word of God. He says, from whence thou fallen, repent and do thy first works. Or else I will come unto thee quickly and remove the candlestick out of thy place, except you repent. Now, what does it mean by candlestick? Remember what Jesus said. 
All right? Remember what Jesus said. Jesus said that So on, uh, Jesus said, no man lights a candle and puts it under a bushel, but he places it on a candlestick that he may give light to the entire house. So, so the purpose of putting on a candlestick, which is an elevated position, is to give light. So if a church gets light, all right? If a church gets light where they are, and or a minister, God sees it fit to lift that person and give, put him on a candlestick. And the purpose is to give light to that whole city. So he gives him a platform, a high platform for that. If they stop making contact or that light stops burning on the inside of them, and that light begins to dim, then he removes the candlestick, which means the platform there, that that person was used to shine there. So he removes that, and that visibility is gone. And you see that in some churches, that in the 90s, you knew about all these churches, they were giving light to the communities. Why did you don't hear about some of those ministries again for this reason? This reason is because once you begin to have some measure of increase in ministry, people get distracted into other works, which is what he was saying there, that they, they get distracted, all right, into other works. So, for example, you begin to preach, results begin to come, people start coming, we say we need a building, your, your prayer life diminishes because you are now the foreman for that building, your, your, your study of God's word diminishes because you are traveling everywhere to go and minister so you don't have enough time as you used to have. Don't forget, I am telling you, you will be hurt deeply. Human beings will dump you. They, once they are no longer getting that Thing that they were getting which came out of your closet, they will dump you with no allegiance to you. And you will be badly hurt by that. And that's why some people are struggling emotionally with that. Because the law of increase says you give up the old to receive the new. So once they feel that you are, or you are holding on to something that is no longer useful to you, all right, and not reaching, so they'll just leave that. So you must understand that is the light. Gentiles are coming to that light, not to you. Kings are coming to the brightness of your rising, not to you. Their commitment is to that light. And if that light begins to dim and it's no longer giving light to them, which means they're not finding their pathways through you, came up. And many people are hurt based on that, feel used and abused. Ministers. Because they can point to people and point to people and say, well, that one came from a church, that one was here, that one came from a church, and these people just go on with their lives as though they are non-existent. All right? I mean, I know a minister who poured himself into many ministries in this country, and he told me one day, he said, listen, he sat down and he's alone. He said, I thought that what was going to happen was that when all these guys broke through, they will invite me and just tell me, well, you preach in this church here, you preach in that church here, and my calendar will be full going into all their churches and preaching. He says, they just dumped me. So he says, I will take the candlestick. It's the candlestick he'll take. All right? And that's it. So that platform, that stuff there, the elevator place is gone. Voice diminishes. So people start getting results and get distracted. And this is the discipline here where you maximize your impact. 
Don't let the increase and the possibilities it creates distract you from the integrity of your calling, which is to minister life to the people. That's why Jesus said, Love, lovest thou me more than these? In other words, these. So when these begin to come, lovest thou me more than these? He said, yes, Lord. He said, feed my people. I bless you with this, but feed my people. So many churches have had their candlesticks removed because they no longer focus on the essential. God removes the candlestick when giving of light is no longer your focus. All right. So I want to say a few things here that the Lord ministered to my heart. Spiritual explosive growth that is coming in 2024 Revival within your churches is the key to it. It is not the programs you organize. Because people come and say, can you tell me tactics that I've got to use? It's not where we have these tactics and we did this and we did that. No, it's revival inside the church. Massive financial blessings will come through revival. There is nowhere there is a massive revival going on that they lack resources. Didn't you see in the book of Acts, when there's a revival going on, people, generosity is there, people in the day of God's power, the people are willing. The key is the revival. All right? When there's a revival, one of the things that comes with it are all these things, people come in, finances. So it's not, oh, what's the strategy for me to see how I can corner money? No, the revival. Now, revival, Please hear what I'm about to say. Scripturally speaking, revival now, scripturally speaking, has never been used for something without God's people. It's something that happens inside. So a revival doesn't happen in the world. A revival happens in a church. A revival happens to a Christian, not to a sinner. A revival happens inside God's house, not outside the house of God. Now the fruits of a revival happen on the outside, but the revival Happens within. It says, revive thy work in the midst of thy people. So it's a revival. So God wants a revival within his churches. I want to explain the conditions for the revival. And this is going back to the first works. So you're not going to throw some flimsy program out there and think that, well, you know, the church will grow if, if we if we had the dancing competition, if we all these flimsy things people throw. It's the key to it is to get a revival. And to get a revival, what you mean is that they say there's an increased and heightened authentic operation of the Spirit of God, which means the operations of the Spirit of God within that congregation has gone up. That's, so there's more life. To revive is to impart life. There's more life, all right, available inside operating inside that church. So people think a revival is something that happens in the world. No, it is an increased activity of the Spirit of God within his church that now results into an overflow on the outside. So even if a person preaches and says, oh, people caught fire, it's because that person is already on fire. The, the getting his servant on fire is the revival. And let me give examples here. Let's look at, just look at where the word revive, and you can do this study by your own self, all right, when you, so there's a second point I want to bring. 2024, it's revival. They we say, well, let me go for a, a, a church group conference, my friend. Revival in your church is the key. Don't start wasting money on, on, on things. And say, oh, we have picnics. People. No, revival. Now, they say revival, yeah, the picnics will come, but you understand that this is condition for revival, and this condition must remain. Judges 15 and verse 19. I just want you to see the word revive. But God clave an hollow place that was in, in the jaw, and there came water there out. And when he had drunk, his spirit came again and he revived. That's, so 
if something comes into the person and that person, when there's a revival, it's inside the church, it's not outside. It's straight at the person, right? So once you go back to the first love, there will always be a revival. All right? So this is on a personal level here. First Kings 19. Sorry, 1 Kings 17 and verse 22. All right, we just want to look at what revival, this stuff on revival. And the Lord heard the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came into him again and he revived. So this is how, what revival means. That means the spirit comes into something and then it revives there. Now in Psalm 85, i um, just talked about it personally now. So we get to the collective and see. So God did not have a revival with the Gentiles. He had a revival inside the nation of Israel. Now, when that revival happens, so the nation of Israel begins to conquer nations, but the revival is inside the nation of Israel. Will thou not revive us again? He says this, that thy people may rejoice in thee. So revival is always within. So when they are revived, they teach transgressors your way. When they are revived, the joy of salvation is restored back onto them. All right. Hosea chapter 6 and verse 2. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up and we shall live in his sight. So those scriptures are pointed for guys within. All right. So it's not going to be by formulas. It's not going to be by copying any other church. My friend, you can't say, let me go and look at the program of some other church and adopt their program when, 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 when there is no awakening of the Spirit of God within the congregation, when there's no increased operation within the congregation. You just take something and paste it on it. So it's going to be authentic. In other words, it's the real operations of the Holy Ghost in a congregation. The local churches, therefore, must fulfill the conditions for a revival and have a quantum leap in the activities of the Spirit of God within its people. All right? And it will come through prayer and the Word of God. And in praying there, you must understand the prayer is not... God bring people into a church. The prayer is for yourselves. Now, if you study all the Pauline prayers, you'll find out. That's why Peter said, God is not slack concerning his promises as some men count slackness, but he's not willing that any should perish but should come to repentance. In other words, God says there's a certain condition that must be inside your heart for me to be able to do this within your midst without violating my moral government or changing who I am to do it. I can remain who I am as God, a God of justice, all right, but this condition. So what you should be praying about if you want to enter into things is God change my heart, my life, who I am, so that that condition is fulfilled there. That's why if you look at the prayers of Paul, Paul didn't say, God, let your work prosper. He asked for the condition, fill us with the knowledge of your will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. That my work worthy of you unto all pleasing, mm. being fruitful in every good work. So the prayer, they knew the condition, he knew it. So he prayed that that condition be fulfilled in them. So the resultant effect of that condition be that manifestation there. He said, one for resurrection part, well, God, let it, no, he said, listen, pray that God will give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation that the eyes of your understanding will be enlightened. Now, once that happens, he said that we can get to the condition. Fill us with the knowledge of your will. Cause us to abound in love, in all knowledge and judgment. We are sincere without offense. He was praying for a change, something within their soul, so that there was stuff on the outside. So, as if you are a senior pastor within the church or you, you're leading a church, now the key to this revival is you have to delegate properly. Because I said this here, if you get some small increase, there can be a distraction. And please hear what I'm about to say. Listen to what I'm saying here. It is not the way you, you may have understood delegation. So don't just say delegation because, because many of you just think delegation means that 
you are getting people involved in the work, so you are delegate. And many people are delegating so that they can now go and do those things that Jesus said, love is down me more than this, is those deeds that they are going with, which means I delegate so I can travel, I delegate so I can now be doing my own ministry, I delegate, and they delegate so that they no longer pastor. That in the definition of what we have said from the beginning. So if you are not here from the beginning, you may not get the context of what we're saying. Now, the key is not being distracted, or the key to not being distracted is get delegation. Now, delegation doesn't mean I give all my work to some other people so that I can be free to enjoy my life. This is how many see it. It is that I distribute these other necessary work among all others, including your own self, which means there's a measure you still have to do, but it's not measure, all right? So that we can all focus on our primary assignment of prayer and truth. In other words, you don't want to delegate all that work to two or three people so they now get distracted, all right? So those people now get distracted from their work, from prayer and all their, and this happens in churches. So you delegated three, four people are praying and then they, from an oligarchy, you get you get principites and powers because you've done it wrongly. It is to take that work and to distribute it so that that load is being carried, all right, completely. But people are carrying fractions of it so that the work is being done, but at the same time, people still have substantial amount of time as Christians there to still or be intimate with God, fellowship with him, pray and study the word of God. So it's important that you make sure that the distribution is even, done evenly across board. So if it's just one other person or a few people, and that's what many people do, they'll take it and say, well, I delegate it to the assistant pastor. Now the assistant pastor now has all the problem he is. Now his own life is wrecking because he's carrying too much load on him. And then the senior pastor now says, well, this has now given me some time, you know, to, to I can now travel, I can do all these things. That's not what delegation is. So if one person of you are carrying all the load, all right, their Christian work will suffer and be affected. All right? So you want to take the entire church for this kind of, to get into the revival, there must be corporate prayers. The church has to be driven to understand that this is the work. And that's why delegation is important. So the usher is not carrying so much load as an usher that when you call for a prayer meeting, they're already tired. Uh, the person leading worship has been leading. You have to delegate that so it, so, so that they get it here, that the major stuff, can, they can go into. That's, the, that's not the weightier matters of the Lord. You focus on the weightier matters. Corporate prayers and the word of God. Pray yourselves that the necessary changes will happen in you so that the word of God will come to pass through you. The change must happen in you. Now, once you begin to pray this way and you get into the word of God, now be having this consistently because it will be like my mentoring program for people. All right, because we'll say mentor, mentor. So I'll just be having these discussions here. Okay. Now, good will come to you. Listen. What will cause the breakthrough of that ministry will come to you. You know, it will come. Okay? And for many of you listening to me, it has come. But you didn't see it. Okay? You didn't see it. Um, Dr. Robert said if they were going to ask him before he died. I went home to be Lord Ram. What's the one message you have for the church? Say the miracle is always coming towards your going past you every day. The question is that you don't see it. Look at Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 6. For it shall be like the heath in the desert and shall not see when good cometh, but shall inhabit patched places in the wilderness. So in other words, anybody who's inhabiting patched places in the wilderness, it's not because good didn't come. They didn't see the good when it came. And let me tell you how people miss this good here. Someone will say something to you that you discarded. That's the good that comes. A church member, a congregation member will make a suggestion, you discarded it. 
Now, I'm not talking about a controlling figure who wants to control the church and every time he's coming and trying to, to send him mails. No. Somebody just walks up and just says, you know what? Um, I think if we do this, we just might have a breakthrough. And he discarded it. All right? And I'll show this here. Keep your eyes open once you start doing this prayer and get into the word here. And your ears wide, you keep your ears and your eyes wide open and don't push away ideas that come from unexpected casual, just coming to you, all right, because you don't find them, first of all, appeal. Now, the way God has structured this in ministry is that when you preach to people, you plant seeds. The fruit of your preaching comes back to you from those people. So when people come to you and just, and just, and, and, and I'm saying this, I'm not controlling people. I know someone that wants to come and control the church and say, so they say, all right, but just say this. Look, Pastor Sunday at Delage, I heard him say this when, he, when his church was the largest church in, largest church in you. And this is, this is unheard of that a person of color will pastor a congregation 99.9% there, and you are not born in that place. Your first language is not that language, and they come and gather that much to you. You know what he said? He said when he was struggling in ministry, he went on a fast for six months. He said, and he will fast. That fast was that he will skip, he won't eat a meal a day. He was fasting, praying, fasting, praying. Fasting, praying, praying, praying. He said nothing was happening. Then he remembered that an old woman had come. You see, all that stuff he was doing about, you know, reaching out, you know, community, going penetrating community and all. He said an old woman, the woman came to meet him and told him something. That let us go and help people in a certain place and we're bringing them to church and just discarded it. That look, this is not you know, what is. He said, God reminded him. And God told him, look, love is the key to this. The love is the key. He said, the woman no longer was coming to church. He went to look for her. She was an elderly woman, founder. He said, what was that thing you told me? He said, that's when the church. He said, pam. All right. Tommy Bennett said the same thing in his book, um, The Miracle is in the House. So someone woke up and said, tell me, just get it. But you see, it will come. Anybody in patch places, the opportunity came. He also discarded it. Somebody will say something. Keep your eyes open. Keep your ears to the ground. All right? Understand that the miracle is in your house. Don't look on the outside. Look within. The strongest churches are going, not going to be churches that are calling outsiders to try to get themselves. It's people that will look within. When God always comes, I've said this, is the statistics tells us that what's it now? 92% of the 80% of people going into mega churches are coming from small churches. The reason is why these small churches here, people don't even appreciate what God, all right, what God, all right, what God has given to them. And I'm telling you, social media is distracting. It's just like how people look at people on social media in the world and say, oh, this person is dressed this way and all of that. All the thing is fake. And people are looking at social media and running with that. Now, all right, understand the miracle is in your house. Look within. So two things, and I'll close it because my time is up. Two areas you look at. Yourself. Now, so when you delegate and create white space for yourself, what you want to do is to move your ministry from that level where it is to a higher level. In other words, your impact must grow. So delegation is to increase your impact. That church cannot go beyond your capa inner capacity there to minister life. Okay? So you go to that next level as a person. So you can grow in greater impact in your ministry by entering into a new dimension of glory as you give yourself back to prayer and to the ministry of the word. It has to be the goal, listen to what I'm saying, of every minister or pastor. It has to be the goal of every pastor that I don't care, your goal, now you may not start that way, I don't care how powerful 
the minister should call to your church to preach if you have a conference. A time must come and within a few years that it is your spirit carrying that conference, not some outsider. That's the real delivery. And this is not that you now diminished in the quality of speakers you are bringing, but you increased in your own capacity to be able to stand on that platform and deliver there. All right, so you can grow in greater impact. So that's why the dedication happens, so you can move up to a new dimension of glory as you give yourself back to prayer, worship, ministry of the word. And then the second thing I will close with this is multiplication in the New Testament is through discipleship. Heard what I said? Multiplication is discipleship. Discipleship is not a class that you take people to and say, this is the discipleship, discipleship class. Have you gone through a discipleship class? No. Discipleship means apprenticeship. An apprentice doesn't go for class like that. An apprentice is hands-on. So when God wanted to multiply impact there, is 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 the calling is multiplying. He said, Get me 70 elders, and I'll take off your spirit and put it on them. You've multiplied it by 70. Straight up. That ministry grows by times 70. It, it's just as simple as that. That's, that's the key to it. All right? So the work. That's why I'm saying that you can't get people so much into fiscal activity that you say you are delegating. It has to be small. Don't let any person or group of people inside your congregation hijack all the work by, by trying to say that, oh, we're the ones available, we're the ones available. Go and look for those who are not available and say, look, no, come, come. They will hide, look, they will hide, and you you get into a place where people will now start telling you, after some time, it will become emotional blackmail. Like, oh, we gave everything, we gave everything. Now, it starts out by saying, oh, bring it, oh, no, we will do it, we'll do it. Then after some time, it's like, we're the ones doing everything, we are not being appreciated, we're not, my life is this, aha, you, they got you. So you have to distribute it across board, all right? And for the sake of those people's lives, so that they also can get into the spiritual aspect of it, of prayer and the ministry of the word. Now, because, listen to this, feeding of people is the primary assignment of that minister there, when you want to multiply, what you're multiplying is the amount of people that are capable of feeding people in that congregation at lower levels. So when Jesus wanted to multiply loaves, which was a multiplication of feeding people, they, listen, that's what the loaves are about. He wanted to multiply loaves, which means, says, give us them down to eat. That's where the multiplication comes. All right? He says, give them to eat. I think people should focus on listening to what I'm saying than asking me whether I'm going to release sessions. You see, let me tell you this. You can't go to a Bible school. I'm going to meet Rema in the Bible school and say, will you be giving us the sessions of what you preach inside the Bible? You, you don't go to Bible school. Or do you go to university and tell the lecturer, please, can you give me a um, question? Listen. Okay? Please. All right? So let's focus. To get what you want and get him. So the multiplication thing. So what did he do? He said, give them. They brought five loaves. He said, you want to multiply it. He said, put them up in companies on green grass, 50 Sundays. Then he gave it to his disciples. Then the disciples gave. So what you want to do is to have a group of people that what God gives to you, you give to them. And that spirit comes upon them. And then they now give to people. That's how the church begins to multiply. Is that original work now that you're passing across? And you know what the problem is with many people who have been Christian for years? This is the dysfunction. And this is why I said by telling that the family which you grew up from determines a lot me, about how you turn out in larger society local church, how you turn out in a society. Many people have done work on the outside, don't know that, but they did not.
catch the spirit of that ministry. They did not get involved in the major work of that ministry, which is teaching. That's why it says a time where you ought to teach. Okay? And here, it's not that that person is called. So that's what it calls. They continued in the apostles, the doctrine of the apostles. The apostles, therefore, do that, that mandate from heaven to get it. Then they gave it to the people, and then those people can now. And that's the key to the multiplication of nature. All right? Where you now stand in that office there of trainer. Now, if a person does that successfully, then God can say, okay, I want you to step into an apostolic thing. But the other person, all right, does that. Okay, at that level. All right? So that's what discipleship is. So a disciple is someone who has learned, worked and learned there, and now knows how to communicate and administer the life and the power of God, all right, to people. Okay? So the more people you have there that are capable, that's key. Okay. So the strength of a church is not just the strength of the set man, but how, how many of those 70 elders are present within that church. You get what I'm saying, myself? That's the strength of the church. You want to look for it? The strength. It's just like a football match. What's the strength of a team in the midfield? If the midfield collapses, it is impossible for that team to win a match. If the midfield collapses, it is impossible to win because that's the link between the defense and the attack. And once that collapses, it's heart failure. That's it. The defense will be under too much pressure. The attack will not have enough supply. I hope again something. I just try to share a few thoughts here. I said we'll be doing this, all right, regularly. Okay, um, concerning that. All right. I'm not in a habit. I'm not in a habit of um, publishing out my webinars because here is the point. Then there'll be no point in having this webinar, so I could just go and teach on YouTube and leave it there. Number two, um, it's not everything I want to go public. It's not everything I want to say in, a, in an enclosed environment that I want to go public. All right. And once you cannot say certain things internally here, then there's just some things you'll not be able to say. So there's no guarantee that I will make any of my teachings. I may not. There's no guarantee I will. All right? God bless you all. And see you some other time. But I believe you have stuff enough for um, um, uh, 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 to make use of in, in what uh, you are doing. All right? Tell your friends about this. This is my mentoring now, and people will get a lot of nuggets concerning this. God bless you all.